Okay, welcome to our webinar series where we make hump day hemp day. I'm Robert Colangelo, host of Green Sense Radio and founder of Hemplet Farms. I'll be your moderator for the webinar series. We're here to raise the bar with like-minded professionals in the hemp community by sharing reliable and trustworthy information so we could all prosper in this emerging hemp market. This is a volunteer effort and it's led by Hemplet Farms and Purdue University Extension Services, the Newton County Soil and Water Conservation District, Biobin, and the Midwest Hemp Council, which is the premier association representing the hemp industry. Jamie Campbell is the executive director and she's in the know and a person you should know if you're in the hemp business. Join the council if you're not a member. Our very own Piper Helpin will kick off today's episode. She's the co-founder of Hemplet Farms. We're a high-tech propagation company fo focused on seedling and clone production in Portage, Indiana. Piper has a background in vertical farming, vegetable production, and contract research. Uh, she oversees operations from seed to sale. And she's a self-proclaimed plant geek. And she's also fluent in millennial which helps us a lot. Piper's favorite part of growing hemp is working with the team of Mythbusters to put cannabis growing urban legends to the test and to find out which ones are true. She's gonna cover the hemp growing process, planning and how to pick a propagator. And then Petrus will pick up with tips on preparing the field, hardening and transplant techniques. Piper, it's all yours. Thanks, Robert. Let's see if I can share my screen. So what I wanna focus on in my talk is more about the process planning and propagation steps and asking your genetics providers the right questions in order to get your field started. Because I think that a lot of times people kind of just jump into the beginning without looking at the big picture. And really my goal is to set the stage for what does the big picture look like and how do we ask all of the questions in order to get us from the beginning to the end. So these 2019 lessons learned, a lot of people have touched on this. Our previous speakers, Maria and Marguerite, really dove into this. So I'm just gonna focus on the last one. There was a lot of poor transplant quality out there. And I think that the main concerns were lack of root development, disease-ridden plants, and um, genetic instability. I think hand in hand with propagation is also genetics. So it's hard to talk about propagation without looking at both the plant litter itself and the genetics that it comes from. So really just honing in on the process of the entire supply chain, it's important as a farmer to understand where you fit in because we are all selling to someone and buying from someone else. And in order for the process to really thoroughly be completed the right way from start to end, it's good to understand who you're buying from who you're selling to and how you're getting there. So if I'm a field farmer, really my first question is, what is the end point of sale? Am I selling this for CBD oil? Am I selling this for smokable flour? Am I selling this for miners? If you're selling for CBD oil, you know, do you have the proper processing, drying, labor plans in order to get that oil to the processor in the way that it needs to be get to? So I think the first thing is just understanding what is your end goal and asking the questions not only to your providers on the genetic side, but to who you're selling it to as to how you need to package and present this in order for it to be successful. Otherwise it will continue to sit on the shelf. So once you understand kind of that big picture supply chain and the process of how your hemp flows through, I think it's really important to understand the hemp growth cycle and implement a plan. So it's, I'm going to use this as an example of one plan and I caveat that all of these growth cycles are dependent on climate, soil types, genetics, and field conditions. But this is just one example of kind of how to look at the big picture of hemp growth as a whole. Because really, when you're looking at transplanting something into the ground, what we usually suggest is end of May or early June, depending on your frost date. And if we're looking to get our seeds and transplants down in June 1st, really, you need to plan four weeks ahead of time when choosing your propagator. That puts you around May 1st. We're right in the middle of April. This puts you within two to three weeks of making decisions on your propagator and your propagation material in order to get those transplants into the ground 
June 1st or when you need to. So after those transplants go into the ground, I think a really important thing to ask your propagator or genetics provider is when your genetic triggers flowering. I think it's a highly missed subject that a lot of people as farmers really need to take the responsibility of asking because a common myth out there is that every genetic flowers at a 12 out of 12 hour photo period. And unfortunately that's not true. <laughs> some do, um, but there are also some that flower at a 13 hour photo period. There are some that even flower as high as 14 hour photo periods. So really talking to your genetics provider and your propagator and understanding when is this ge genetic going to flower and what date do I need to put this in the ground so that I know it's not going to prematurely flower. So I have a really great link at the bottom. I've actually just been exposed to this link and it's been helping our process a lot. It's called timeanddate.com and it really just shows daylight hours per day throughout the calendar year. So once you have that conversation with your genetic provider or your propagator, check your date and time schedules online. It's free. You could see when exactly you're putting it in the ground, what your daylight hours are, and what date your flowering will trigger. Because you know from that date you will have six to eight weeks of a flowering period before your harvest. I think the last point I want to harp on on this growth cycle is really understanding at the end of the growth cycle your CBD and your THC levels are continuously changing as the plant grows. I think one of the most common errors that I've heard out there is that, you know, my COA says it's going to be X percentage CBD. I don't understand why it went over. It's really about the fact that when the plant grows, your THC and your CBD are continuously changing upon harvest. And so if you're testing weekly within that last five weeks before harvest, you're going to get a very clear and thorough understanding of how your CBD and THC levels are changing. Robert, did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> um, so diving a little bit deeper into this relationship between CBD and THC, I really just want to highlight Keep in mind in this next slide, what state you're in. If you are in a total THC state versus a Delta nine state, this will have a huge effect on the genetics that you pick. And circling this back to propagation, really understanding those THC and CBD levels will help you determine at the beginning what genetics and propagation techniques you need to use. So I'm giving an example of a genetic that we actually provide and it's Southern OG via our partner, the Headline. Um, this genetic has the total potential of reading 18% CBD, which is great. That's a great percentage of CBD. So looking at this graph, if you follow the green line, it basically starts on the calendar year at week 34 to week 40. When you follow that green line from week 34 up to week 40, it shows how the CBD is climbing as the plant develops. And it also shows that at week 40, you really do have a potential of reaching 18% CBD max. However, what I also wanna show is the blue line. The blue line at week 34 also starts low and climbs all the way at week 40 up to 0.8. That is over the legal limit of total THC. So just because a genetic has been advertised to you as a maximum potential of CBD does not mean that the relationship between that and the total THC has been taken into account. So as a farmer, as the buyer, you need to ask your propagators, your genetics partners, are you providing me the percent of CBD total or are you providing me the percent of CBD in relation to harvest at point three? So as the example with this genetic, our legal limit is shown in red for total THC, it's 0.3. When you look at where the CBD line hit, hits the legal limit, it's only giving you a seven to 8% CBD yield. So really you've been advertised at 18%, but really, you know, if you're abiding by the law, you are harvesting early and you're only getting seven to 8%. That is a huge difference. So really picking the right genetic and understanding the relationship between the CBD and the THC levels is going to help you in forecasting 
you know, what questions to ask and who to work with on the propagation end. Just as a side note, I do want to show the line at the bottom of this graph is gray and it's a little bit hard to see, but this shows the Delta 9 THC levels. Now there are some states right now that are still abiding by, by Delta 9 and Illinois is one of those states that we work with. Um, we, the reason we provide this genetic is because if you are a Delta 9 operating state, you will not surpass the 0.3 THC level with your Delta 9 percentages. It shows very clearly that Delta 9 is below 0.1% and you're still getting that 18% CBD maximum rate. So when we present genetics to Delta 9 states, these are the types of genetics we're pre presenting, but we would never present something to a total THC state because the relationship does, doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to harvest a 7% CBD crop. So really ask your genetics providers. The takeaway from this is, you know, are you showing me the maximum potential CBD or are you showing me the CBD in relation to the regulation in place, 0.3 total THC? That's a huge question to ask. Um, I think the next really important question in talking to your genetics provider and your propagator is to do some genetics due diligence. I think that the most overlooked part, I think everyone immediately jumps to the COA and looks for CBD levels and THC levels. That's the first thing on everyone's mind, which I agree, I do the same thing. But I think that, you know, taking a step back and having a process in place for how to do your due diligence is going to help in making a more informed decision. So if you, step one, you know, the first question you need to ask is where was this sample taken on the plant and when was this sample taken? If a COA shows, you know, a very extreme CBD percentage or THC percentage, it's completely possible that it was taken from the top eight inches of the plant within 10 days of harvest. There will be a huge difference in numbers on these COAs if you're taking from a certain portion of the plant and a certain amount of days away from harvest. So the number one question to ask is where was it taken on the plant and when was it taken? Because if this COA was taken 30 days before harvest, it will not show you accurate numbers at harvest, it will show you lower numbers than harvest. So really have that conversation and ask those questions. Um, and then step two is obviously understanding the COA, you know, research the reputability of the lab in the top left corner. There are plenty of reviews online. Find a lab that has reviews. Um, ask how the samples were taken. I think a really overlooked one, surprisingly, is look at the date on the COA. We've had a few people provide us COAs from 2017. It's it will not help you to have a COA from 2017 for your genetics this year. So really make sure that your genetics COAs are from 2019 for the 2020 growing season. Look at the type of analysis. There's a difference in plant versus concentrate and then look at the signature to make sure this document is legally binding. Um, once you've done all of this information, then you can really look at your cannabinoid profiles. You can look at your Delta 9. You can look at your CBD, your total THC, and you can really digest where those numbers are coming from rather than just coming to a piece of paper blind. So once we've understood the process of the supply chain and the planning needed in order to pick your genetic, you're finally kind of ready to start your propagation strategies. And there's really three strategies in starting your field. You can start from seeds, seedlings, and clones. Um, I've highlighted a little bit of the, you know, best character traits of each starting method. Starting with seeds, I mean, no doubt seeds are the lowest cost option on the market. Um, I think that most people purchasing seeds will pre-start these seeds as plantlets and transplant them themselves. Very few people that we've talked to will start a field from seed, although it is being done. So we would just recommend if you're new to this process, if you have not farmed hemp, you know, I would highly encourage you to look towards a plantlet option rather than a seed um, because it's a little bit easier. A seed does have a lower germination rate due to climatic factors. If there's overwatering, underwatering, um, animals have been known to eat seeds. It just will really affect the success of your field. 
Um, the other two are seedlings and clones. And really these are kind of the combating brother and sister. And they're both really good for different reasons. Um, seedlings are a much lower cost than clones typically because they're easier to automate um, and put through a seeding machine. And they do have lower grow times than seeds. Um, their field success rate is very high as well as clones. The major difference in clones is that it is a genetic replica of a mother. So you are guaranteed a female unless being stressed in the field in which it will turn to a hermaphrodite potentially. But your success in growing a female is going to be the highest when using clones. So because seedlings and clones are kind of the most popular methods of propagating. I'm going to deep dive into the differences because people do get ask us all the time, you know, what exactly is the morphological difference between a seedling and a clone? And I think the biggest difference here is that a seedling has a taproot. A taproot is basically an anchoring root that will penetrate through three layers of soil or more and really anchor it heavier into the ground, whereas a clone will have more of a fibrous root system, which is equally as successful in anchoring in certain soil types, but other soil types would prefer a taproot versus a fibrous root system. So Petrus will go more into kind of soils and how to look at different field conditions in determining seedlings versus clones, but I just wanted to point out the difference morphologically. Um, we talked about the genetic variation in seedlings. You know, you are starting it from seed. A seed is a genetically unique object and it will be different in every plant. Um, you can get feminized seeds and seedlings, which is what most of the propagators will provide, um, but there will be a percentage of males involved versus a clone being a genetic female copy. Um, I would say just a little bit of cons on both to compare. Cons on seedlings are the germination rates and the male rates. If you're working with a propagator, those germination rates should be mitigated. They should be giving you 100% plants, um, but you will still have a male rate. Uh, a negative, a little bit of a clone is that if a mother plant is infected with a pest or a disease or something contaminating it, it will transfer into the clone. So, you know, as a, as a cultivator, take the responsibility of saying, can you please show me a picture of your mother? Can you please show me a picture of the clones? Please show me a picture of the roots. You know, hold your propagators responsible because a lot of companies out there are not, you know, looking out for you. You need to look out for yourself. <laughs> Ask the questions. And, and in my personal opinion, a cell phone picture is the best picture because it means that it's real and someone has just taken it right there. I Last point, I think that seedlings touching a little bit on soils. Seedlings are typically better for sandy soils versus clones in clay soils. But again, I will let Petrus kind of elaborate a little bit more on that. So once you've kind of chosen your method, I think it's important to really know your propagator. Um, there are two kind of methods of propagation right now. A greenhouse is definitely the traditional version versus a vertical farm is kind of the new kid on the block in the high tech realm. Um, both options are going to give you optimum growing conditions for year round production. They're both going to allow you to mitigate the weather and jumpstart your growing season by June 1st. They've pre-grown these plantlets for you. Um, they do have precise scheduling of plant production. In our production, we work with farmers with very strict crop schedules so that they know exactly when it's coming to them, exactly when it's going in the ground, exactly when it's triggered flowered, and exactly when it's coming out of the ground. So, you know, the your propagator should be able to help you in planning your crop um, and obviously provide that buffer for bad weather. Things to consider when looking at both types of propagation, I think that the number one thing to consider is your hardening capabilities. Do you have the capability to harden on site on your field or do you need these to come to you pre-hardened? Both strategies, there's not one right or wrong answer. It's what are your capabilities as a farmer? And asking your propagator, do you have those capabilities, hardening or non-hardening, or hardening recommendations? Um, also considering hygiene is very important. You don't want your plantlet to come disease-ridden. Um, 
I would say they're both very hygienic ways of growing. However, a vertical farm is going to be completely sealed from the outdoor environment versus a greenhouse is going to have a little bit more pest problems um, because it's communicating with the outdoors. So as far as hygiene and climate goes, I would say you're gonna have a little bit higher standard in an indoor vertical farm because of it's sealed from the environment. And then finally, um, consistency of production. You know, just make sure that what's coming out of that farm today is also coming out of that farm in 15 weeks because you know having one good crop as a propagator does not help anyone your job is to continuously have good quality product available so now that you've you know understood the process kind of put a plan in place and chosen a propagator i think the final considerations are what petrus is really going to hit on and it's a lot about hardening. It's a lot about, okay, I've chosen my genetics. I've chosen who I'm working with. How am I going to prepare them for my field so that they're going to be successfully ready to go in the ground? And then also transportation is something that just extremely gets overlooked. And I think it's crucial to understand that if we're transporting live plants in the middle of the summer, you know, take into consideration a temperature control truck if you have the ability. Um, look at packaging options. The, you don't have to put every tray in a box. There's rental racking programs available. You know, there's exchange programs available. There's a lot of things at our disposal and they can be taken advantage of. And then finally with transportation, just look at your liabilities and your insurance coverage. It's really kind of touch and go right now as to who's responsible at what part in the process. So talk to your genetics provider, talk to your propagator. You know, when is it my responsibility? Is it when it leaves your door? Is it during transit? And is it when it gets to my field? And at all of those stages, am I covered in any way? Um, those are questions that each company will kind of handle in a different manner. So definitely bring those up. Um, and then finally transplanting, which Petrus will also touch on. Um, so I will, Hand it off to Petrus. Can you explain the difference between Delta 9 and total THC? So Delta 9 and total THC, let's come back here. Delta 9 THC is basically one derivative of the compound. Um, total THC takes into account after harvest, certain cannabinoids that break down that can convert into THC. And so when looking at total THC, it's, you know, it's one of those things where when the regulations were first put in place, it was what THC is measurable right at harvest versus now the regulations are really looking at what are the different cannabinoids that can break down over time and also contribute to THC levels. That's a little it's a basic summary. Um, another question, and this may be more for Petrus, but I'll throw it out. In Indiana and Illinois, what would you ideally plan uh, as the best time to put seeds or seedlings into the soil? Um, I think ideally would probably be around that June 1st time frame. I will have Petrus definitely give his opinion on that, but from what I've heard, it's after last frost, so end of May might be a little bit too soon. You might be looking closer to that first week of June. I've known Petrus for years. And uh, what I like about Petrus is not only is he a professor, but he's very down to earth and very practical about his advice. And he is a horticulture and hydroponics crop specialist in the Department of Horticulture and uh, Landscape Architecture at Purdue University. But what you may not know about Petrus is that he's originally from the wine lands in South Africa. And he loves barbecue and to eat Mediterranean food and enjoy a glass of good wine with family and friends. He's a huge rugby fan and he had an extremely good time during the 2019 Rugby World Cup with his West Lafayette friends that are from Wales and New Zealand because his team, the Spring Bucks, were triumphant. So with that, I'd like to introduce my friend, Dr. Petrus Langenhoven. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so the title of my presentation to continue on our topic today is to looking at increasing success rate from the propagator to the field. And I was just about to uh, talk about uh, um, the outline of the presentation, looking at some considerations, some tools that you can use uh, to help you plan uh, your way ahead, um, looking at how some 
transplant propagation procedures might affect the survival rate in the field um, on farm transplant handling once you have received received your uh, plant material, um, optimizing some of your uh, field conditions for transplant survival and uh, some important decision-making questions that you uh, might possibly want to ask your propagators going through the process. I think this is uh, all very important since uh, there's quite a high price tag on genetic material uh, in the CBD hemp uh, realm. So we wanna make sure that we get as uh, close as possible to 100% uh, field establishment. Looking at uh, planning uh, for your possible transplant date, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about in the next few slides. And basically, I'm going to show you some resources that are out there that you can uh, visit on a regular basis to, uh, to see what your conditions are like. But basically, climate, looking at uh, DLI, soil type and geographic location, soil temperature, some of our precipitation, um, uh, forecast here in Indiana, uh, freeze dates, and how some of your other farm activities might influence um, your actual uh, hemp planting. Now, I think we're all familiar with this uh, um, climate uh, hard in the zone map of uh, the United States and Indiana. And uh, as we have seen with uh, last year, you know, nothing really plans out uh, the way we would like to do it. Um, we had a crazy season last year with all that rain coming in. Anyway, Indiana is a, a very interesting state. Um, we have uh, a hosting about three different climatic zones and the southern part of the state is, uh, is the warmest part. Uh, it also warms up earlier in the season. Um, so obviously some producers down here in the southern part, southwestern part of the state might be able to plant a lot earlier than uh, growers up in a the northern northwestern part of the state. So looking at where your geographic location is um, will uh, help you to determine that uh, planting day too. And looking at your uh, daily light integrals, this is courtesy of uh, Elizabeth Maynard and her collaborators. They developed these uh, maps last year for us. So daily light integral is really just an indication of the amount of uh, photosynthetic active radiation um, as a function of light intensity and duration um, that is received on a, on a daily basis. So these maps are uh, more on, uh, on the basis of an average over a month uh, period. And you can see, if you look at the, the legend, the very colorful legend on the side, and you look at uh, each month of the year, how your DLI is changing. Uh, we can see here in May, we are already up in the, the high 30s, um, early, uh, low 40s. And then June and July, uh, we are at max. That's also when our days are the longest, um, up in the, the mid 40s to high 40s uh, in terms of uh, DLI. So that is light being measured between 400 and 700 nanometers. It doesn't uh, address any other uh, ultraviolet radiation that's before um, or less than uh, 400 nanometers and uh, all your infrared that's uh, above 700 uh, nanometers. And you will see the relevance of that as we uh, move on through the presentation. This is uh, just in a different, uh, presented in a different way, average uh, per month. And we can see here, June, July, uh, across Indiana, we are uh, in the upper 40s, 45 uh, moles per square meter per day. And you correlate that with uh, our day length. And I use that same website um, uh, that Piper was talking about earlier. Um, and uh, just looked at uh, the first and the 15th of the month. The first is the blue bar and the, the 15th, the orange bar. And uh, we can see here we are over 14 hours um, of light. Um, but that includes also your dawn and dusk uh, period. So, um, but yeah, Piper had a very good chart there about uh, the growth cycle of him. And uh, usually it's by the, like she says, by the end of July, uh, into August that you will uh, see uh, flower initiation uh, starting to happen. Now, this is uh, courtesy of uh, Professor Daryl Schutz in the Department of Agronomy. I got these uh, soil maps from them, uh, or from him. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have uh, a map just looking at the different parent materials uh, across the, the state of Indiana. This is the Wabash uh, River flowing down here. On the right-hand side, 
we're looking at the different drainage classes um, of the soil. So your well-drained soils are uh, these dark brown colors, moderately well, moderately well a lighter uh, brown and a very light brown um, is somewhat poorly drained. And then you get into the grays, which is poorly drained. So we can see a lot of our soils are actually not uh, well drained. And uh, it, in that sense, it is uh, it's very important not to get to this kind of catastrophe that we have seen last year. You are already spending a lot of money on your uh, plants that you are purchasing from your propagator. Um, very expensive. Make sure that uh, the land you're going to put it on is also well drained, um, either with tile drain or naturally well drained, um, and uh, that your plants will uh, thrive in that. Some uh, interesting soil temperature uh, maps that are uh, mainly aimed at, um, used by the, the corn and bean growers, um, but uh, I think everybody can get some information from this. And it's the Midwestern Regional Climate Center that develops uh, these maps. This was uh, a soil temperature map at four inches deep on uh, April 7. And uh, we can see here that the soil temperatures were around 65, uh, 60 and then uh, uh, around 55 to the northeastern part of the state. And that changed a little bit to this week. We are actually cooler um, and we know what happened with the weather uh, in the meantime. Uh, same again, the National Weather Service has these uh, uh, temperature and uh, precipitation uh, forecast maps. And uh, we are currently experiencing uh, what is going on on this map. And uh, we can see this dark blue circle here um, in terms of uh, a prediction that our temperatures are going to be 80 percent um, below, there's a probability that it's going to be below uh, the average. So, and this might go on between the April 16 and April uh, 22nd. Um, the latest outlook uh, between April 22nd and 28th uh, shows a little bit uh, better picture where uh, we are at normal or uh, slightly below normal. In terms of precipitation, uh, we are pretty much normal uh, for the week of uh, April 16 to 22nd. And then uh, from April 22nd to 28th, uh, we might be slightly above uh, normal. And uh, I was actually having a quite a fun activity this morning. Uh, we were laying plastic down to, uh, um, to plant uh, uh, hemp later in, in May. And uh, we used the opportunity with the dry ground that's out there uh, but while doing the activity, we also had some snow in us. So that was uh, pretty interesting. And it just shows you how uh, uh, interesting the climate here in Indiana is. <laughs> um, looking at the last frost state uh, or freeze state, this is also important to note for your specific, specific location. Um, this morning, we had a 30 degree uh, uh, low in Lafayette. Tomorrow, it's going to be 28. And the day after that, it's also going to be 30. Um, so this is a pretty late uh, 28 degree uh, frost state for us. Um, looking at the map, this addresses the 28 degree um, uh, last uh, frost state. So you can see here on these maps um, that uh, for your area, you can see where um, those dates are. This is the map that indicates the 32 degree uh, last freeze date. And it changes across the state and, and we can see um, for the southwestern part of the state, it's uh, very early in April. They should not be expecting uh, a frost again unless the weather really turns bad. But yeah, so the links on the, the slides are uh, live and um, you can click on those to get to the um, website that manages these maps and uh, get your own information from there too. So looking at how this activity fits into your other uh, farm activities, um, looking back in the production uh, cycle, you know, harvest is usually between mid-September and, and mid-October, and it takes about 100 to 120 days uh, after transplanting to, to get to that point. And uh, we don't always have the perfect weather like we have seen last year with all that rain. And that's why I also went in today to, to put in our raised beds and make sure the beds are made and ready and good to go uh, by the time we, uh, we are ready to plant and the, the temperature is up. Um, just looking at other uh, farm activities, you know, are you a corn or soybean uh, grower or, or do you plant any other specialty crops? Usually when planting season starts, there's so much going on 
and uh, it, it will be uh, uh, very good to coordinate activities well during that time of year to make sure that the investment that you have already made into your uh, seedlings are uh, maintained and, and taken through to, to the field in terms of timely planting. How many acres are you going to plant? Um, how quickly will you be able to plant your acres? Um, and that really brings to the point that you're planting by hand or you making any uh, use of uh, mechanical transplanters. Um, what is the, the pool of labor that you have access to? Um, um, and then how does the, the COVID-19 guidance uh, affect the labor on your farm? And I was, uh, was honestly hoping not to bring that into the presentation, but it is a reality nowadays and uh, we will probably not be rid of it by uh, the time we get our plants in, in the ground. So we have to uh, take that into consideration when planning the, the planting activity on the farm and not delay that uh, longer than what it should be uh, upon arrival of your plants. Okay, so how does your plant, plant transplant propagation procedures affect infield uh, survival rates? Um, this is just some uh, interesting uh, work that we started here at Purdue, looking at two different uh, types of uh, uh, trays that we use. This is a 50 count round plug, and this is a 72 count uh, hexagon uh, tray that's a little bit deeper too. And you can clearly see the difference in root development. These roots are going nicely down into the plug and these circle around to the top. Now these transplants will held in the, the trays for a little bit longer than was necessary, but I was trying to prove that point to see, you know, what happens if you keep your plants too long at the farm. Um, but in general, um, this is a tendency in the round plug to, uh, to get that root girdling uh, happening in the cell. Okay, so looking at uh, propagators, so uh, Piper mentioned earlier that uh, we are vertical farm and other, uh, farms and other indoor operations that uh, also uh, do transplant propagation. Then you can also do it in a high tunnel, the greenhouse uh, setup. And obviously when you are in a facility where you exclude sunlight from uh, entering the facility, the plants are not used to that additional light uh, that's being received. Um, we have a very narrow band, that 400 to 700 nanometers uh, that we uh, uh, give our plants light um, at, uh, in an indoor facility. And uh, so when you take your plants directly from the indoor facility out to the field, um, there's gonna be an immense of uh, uh, transplant shock um, the plant will experience with all that additional ultraviolet uh, radiation that it's going to uh, receive. The leaf cuticle is just not thick enough to handle that uh, kind of radiation. So to avoid this, um, you might want to consider a hardening of your transplant uh, transplants on farm. Um, you want to make them used to a, a different environment at a slow pace, you know, more direct sunlight over time, uh, additional wind, and uh, even get them used to rain falling on them and that will all toughen up the, the seedlings before they get uh, put out in the field. So we would like to really reduce that stress and if we can reduce the stress or that transplant shock in the plant, that will increase the, the survival rate of your uh, plants in the field. And just two signs of an unhappy uh, uh, plant is uh, drooping of or curling of uh, the, the leaves of, of those transplants. Okay, so on-farm transplant handling. What do you do once you have received your plants? I think if you don't collect your plants yourself and you have your plants delivered, even if you go to the propagator to collect your plants, it's uh, important to actually inspect your, uh, your material. Look for any disease, look for any pests. Uh, I wouldn't expect any disease to be on those little transplants, uh, but pests might be there. You might have aphids or mites or anything. Um, if uh, there's some issue within the, the propagator's uh, facility. So uh, look carefully for that. Um, if you don't have any um, identification tools, you can always send it to the Purdue plant uh, diagnostic lab and, and they can uh, assess what uh, pest this is. Um, obviously we know there's not a lot to spray on these crops. Um, so you might want to implement some uh, predator uh, activity in uh, your your propagation or uh, hardening of facility on farm uh, to make sure that uh, you keep those uh, pests at bay. So the scout on a regular basis too while they are in the, the hardening of phase. So 
The best is to use a, a shade house and you harden them off between seven to 10 days. That would be great uh, to get them uh, acclimated to uh, farm conditions. A cold frame is a very uh, cheap and simple structure to use. I mean, you can make a, a shade cloth structure basically out of anything. You just need about a 30% shade cloth and, and you can uh, get the plants under that. Um, if your season is still a little bit too cool towards your planting uh, date and you, you expect frost, uh, you might want to do that in a, in a high tunnel or use a, a cold frame with plastic over it and uh, over time increase the amount of uh, airflow uh, in that uh, structure. With high tunnels, obviously, it's easy when you have roll-up windows, um, you can, you can uh, control the, the climate and the airflow with that uh, in there. Uh, so yeah, gradually introduce it to higher light intensities. Make sure that the temperatures at night doesn't fall, be, uh, flow, uh, fall below 50 degrees Fahrenheit uh, or during the day um, that it goes higher than 80 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in the structure. Um, remember to irrigate those plants. So there must be some sort of irrigation system in place. Overhead watering might be a very good idea. Um, uh, gradually increase the pressure of your water that you also provide. Um, it's a very small thing, but it does help the plant to get acclimated to uh, rainfall in uh, most of our uh, propagation, uh, especially the indoor propagation facilities, um, like the vertical farm that the anchor farm uh, is running. Watering is done from the bottom up, um, so plants never really experience any waterfall from on the leaves. In a, a, a seed Seedling grower facility, uh, high tunnel greenhouse where overhead spray booms are used. That's a little bit of a different story, but you can also uh, try to uh, simulate that uh, rainfall uh, on your farm while hardening off your plants uh, with uh, overhead watering. Uh, don't overwater. You want to get your plants a little bit used to less water, but don't let your plants wilt. Um, you can give less water or you can reduce the frequency of watering, but uh, key is to, to monitor uh, the situation uh, closely. And then again, your propagators usually make sure that their water is uh, in very good uh, chemical uh, condition. Um, pH is good, alkalinity is low, um, not too much iron. So please make sure that the water that you irrigate on these plants um, are treated, or at least you have an analysis done on that well where you get the water from, uh, so you know what to do with the water to uh, get it to a uh, a quality that is acceptable to your plant. So you don't want to stress your plant out by increasing the pH in the plug for a, for a week to 10 days uh, and then by putting the plant uh, at stress. Okay, so optimizing field conditions for uh, transplant survival. Um, obviously check that uh, chance for, uh, for frost when it's that last event uh, possibly going to happen. Soil conditions, would like to use well-drained soil, uh, loamy if possible, rich in organic matter, and uh, slightly acidic. Um, so these combination of things are not always uh, available in any specific location, but uh, we would like to, to try to get to that as close as possible. And if you do not have a, a very well-drained soil, use raised beds, uh, get tile draining there, or do some uh, other activity to increase uh, drainage in your field. Obviously planting options, as I mentioned, raised beds uh, could be used uh, with plastic mulch. Uh, we know that there's not a lot of, uh, well, there are actually not herbicides registered for use uh, within uh, hemp. And uh, that makes it very easy, but there are also no total cover uh, options like in the picture you see on the left um, where a cover crop was planted and then you just uh, direct transplant into that. In terms of plastic mulch, there are the two schools of thought in terms of black and white plastic mulch. Black mulch obviously gives you an advantage of uh, early heat uh, in your soil uh, early in the season. Um, and uh, I think that's good for locations that has cooler soils in the beginning of the season. Obviously your plant, once you have transplanted it, it will grow fast, it will overshadow that material and uh, it will uh, cool or keep cooler soil temps um, if you are concerned about uh, very high soil temperatures during the summer. White plastic, of course, will have uh, um, a reflection of light um, and therefore the soil temperatures will not be as high and that might be very useful in areas that are much warmer 
Um, and also you get that added uh, reflection of light in the lower canopy of the plant um, that will boost uh, photosynthesis. But obviously that is also filtered out as the plant shades uh, more of that plastic as the, the season goes on. Um, you may also use a, a harrow, a power harrow or a rototiller uh, before the bed spader, uh, bed shaper um, to make those clots finer. You know, the, the smaller the clots are in your bed, the better contact you're going to have with your plug. I mean, that's so important to get uh, very good soil contact once you put that plug in the ground. Um, otherwise, um, the plug is just going to dry out and the roots will not get into the soil uh, directly at that point. Soil moisture at fill capacity, that will be great. You know, if you do make uh, raised beds uh, and you lay drip tape under that uh, plastic when you put it down, um, irrigate the bed. I mean, get it to a good moisture uh, condition and uh, so that those plants can accl uh, acclimatize uh, well uh, in terms of uh, roots in the ground. Um, your plug will be moist. You put that plug in the ground uh, that's dry and uh, obviously your roots are going to uh, feel that dryness in the ground, that ground is probably going to be a lot uh, warmer as well. So be careful um, um, having a, a, to transplant in a, in a very dry uh, soil environment. Uh, fertilize uh, before laying plastic. If you want to put some granular fertilizer down, uh, that would be great. We're not going to talk about rates today. Um, you can also fertigate uh, fertilizer through the irrigation system during the rest of the season. But yeah, make sure that the root ball of your plug is covered with soil. You get that wicking effect of uh, moisture out of the, uh, the plug if it's not covered, and that will surely mean a uh, very quick uh, death uh, of your seedling. Okay, so some questions that you might ask your propagator, uh, are they using uh, indoor lighting uh, to grow their, uh, uh, your transplants in that sense? Um, usually LED or HPS lighting, HPS lighting more in greenhouses, LED lighting is uh, used more in uh, indoor vertical farms. Um, what light cycle are they using indoors to grow the plants? Is it an 18, uh, six hour uh, day night cycle or is it any other cycle? How closely match that cycle to conditions that are in the field? And I think that's one of the challenges of uh, indoor propagators. Um, you have a specific uh, DLI of a, between 15 to 20 inside the, the propagation facility that you can achieve with your light, light in, a, uh, in that sense. And you, you plant your plants out in the beginning of June and you're already sitting with a 40 uh, DLI outside and that's excluding the ultraviolet light and, and other light that's, uh, that's out there. So how close can the propagator bring your, uh, um, the transplant conditions to what you're going to experience uh, in the field? What growing media <clears throat> was used, what propagation trays, I think the cell shape will count. Um, those are important things to talk about before um, you uh, uh, purchase the plants, because you might have a specific transplanter um, that you get a big experience with a specific count or cell size. Um, obviously with, with bigger uh, cell sizes, the plants can remain a little bit longer in the tray uh, compared to uh, a cell size that's uh, a lot smaller. And that really helps in conditions where you have poor um, uh, weather out there, uh, very wet swells or temperature uh, issues and, and so on. That will help you to keep the transplant a little bit longer at the farm. Um, you, you could ask the propagator what the disease and pest management <clears throat> or IPM program is like. Um, and as uh, Piper said, you know, can uh, your propagator hard off your plants. If you don't have the infrastructure or you don't have the time to commit to that, um, because that can always uh, be added to the cost of the, the plant, of course. Um, but on the other hand, once you get the plants to the farm, you have control over it and uh, you can plant whenever you are ready uh, to get those in the ground. Um, and as Piper has also mentioned, you know, how are plants transported to the farm, even if it's your own vehicle? Are you using some form of refrigeration to get the, uh, the material to your farm? You don't want to stress them out by having too high temperatures in a, in a box uh, on the back of a truck or expose them to high wind. Um, you may also ask if you could visit the propagator's facility to see how your uh, plants are progressing. That will be all up to the propagator if they allow uh, people to come into their facility. There's always some disease and uh, insect concerns in that sense. Um, 
Well, yeah, so that's uh, briefly what I would like to talk about this afternoon. And uh, my contact details are in the bottom, uh, right? And uh, feel free to, to reach out if you have uh, any questions. Thank you. Petrus, the question was, is there an ideal soil range for planting? Uh, for so, temperature. Soil temperature. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would say anything above uh, 60 degrees will be perfect because uh, at 65, that's usually when we put some uh, tomatoes and peppers and those kind of things in the ground, perfect for them. So uh, I would say uh, in that range will be great for a, a, a transplant too. That means it will correlate more or less with what the, the air temperature outside is and we should be much warmer than that, so yeah. Um, this question's for both Piper and Petrus. Can you talk about tissue culturing uh, as, as a way to propagate? <laughs> Piper, you <laughs> <laughs> I guess I would, I would just give the opinion that tissue culture is a phenomenal um, technology. I think it's really great for preserving genetics and um, introducing you know, old strains into a new line. Um, I don't necessarily think that the technology has a lot of um, potential for scaling up on the labor end for propagation. So currently I've seen um, a few people that have done it and I think the technology will continue to improve. Um, but currently I think it's a little bit labor intensive. Um, the what other question, it? yeah, the other question, uh, Pestris, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, you know, obviously it's a, an excellent technique to quickly multiply a specific genetic uh, source um, in a very true to genetic way, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I probably also think it's, uh, it's not something that uh, anybody in, in their personal capacity will put up. Um, the equipment is pretty expensive. Um, but yeah, great technology. Yes, and I guess my, my experience is that the, uh, to do uh, tissue culture and automate becomes a very expensive proposition. And if you don't automate the process then you're just trading uh, different labor types. And so I think it's a great technology that will continue to approve, but we're still sort of at the beginning of it for hemp. Um, another question we had, and this one's much more complicated is, uh, do you have any comments or recommendations for growing hemp uh, uh, or best practices for growing in an indoor greenhouse? using the natural growing cycle? And specifically, how do you get seedlings started out properly? You know, what are the best humidity levels and soil recommendations, again, for a greenhouse? Piper or Petrus, either one of you want to tackle that? I'm going to let Petrus tackle that as he's the <laughs> greenhouse expert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, obviously with uh, a greenhouse, I would say you have the advantage, if you talk about the uh, a fully climate controlled greenhouse, you have the advantage of uh, controlling that uh, um, actual flowering period. So uh, you have the possibility of probably getting two to three crops in a year if you don't want to do it by the natural uh, weather cycle or sunlight cycle and you have some uh, supplemental lighting in the, in the, the structure. So there are uh, great possibilities there, but honestly, I don't know what the economics of this is uh, in a greenhouse, you know, so it's hard to say um, what uh, is really going to work. Techniques, I think, is pretty well known in terms of what is happening in the cannabis industry in greenhouse. There's a lot of information out there and uh, it's more or less the same plan, um, just a different species that we are working with. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I don't think we have time to really go into anything uh, deeper than that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's very variable and it's very uh, site dependent on the greenhouse. Right. So here's another question is where do propagators get their seeds? I think that just speaking from um, my personal experience, propagators will either be their own genetics source in breeding their own seeds um, or they will source them domestically. I, we have two propagation par or two genetics partners. Um, one is specifically focused on the Midwest and one is located on the Eastern side of the United States. Um, so I think it's propagators are sourcing their genetics from all over the United States. Um, Petrus, here is a, uh, uh, a question for you. Uh, 
this uh, is an outdoor field farmer and they have about one acre nestled in a field with no real access to water. Will it be feasible for seeds or seedlings to survive without additional irrigation setup? Um, I guess if you make seedlings from seed, at least you have the taproot advantage there and your plant can uh, tap water from uh, the deeper layers of the soil. Um, but you might have a hard time during you know, that dry spell that we usually get in July, August, uh, to get your plants through, through that and uh, actually increase biomass and, and make sure that you have enough flower production uh, to be able to harvest a, a good CBD uh, percentage at the end of the day. So I don't know. It, it all depends on the, when the rain is coming or not. You know, uh, last year we had so much rain at the beginning of the season, then June it was gone, and then later in the season we had more rain. So I would say it's a bit of a gamble if you're just going to rely on uh, rainfall to, to get your crop going since you invest so much money in that uh, plant already. Um, thank you. Uh, one other uh, follow-up question on tissue culture was uh, the idea of using tissue culture to preserve genetics and not pass on uh, pathogens. Uh, either of you want to tackle that? So tissue culture is not only used for propagation, but it can also be used to store genetics. Uh, do you want to speak to uh, the efficacy of that? I think, yeah, that's kind of what I was saying earlier is that I think it's a really great technique in preserving genetics. Um, it's it's at the top of its class, but I think that that's its best use currently um, and using it in a propagation setting might be challenging. Right. Well, again, thank you, uh, Piper, and uh, thank you, Petrus. You did an excellent job. Mm -hmm.